don't run? What are you, soldiers or women? Stay with me. Make a stand over here. after wars are over, stories are told about how they were won. We sometimes forget how close the winning side was to losing. We sometimes forget what heroes were like before they were heroes. And once in a while, a real hero is forgotten altogether. You girls gonna be in a heap of trouble. You best be going. Didn't you hear the bell? We were a long way off. Well, get cleaned up. Yes, ma'am. Where have you been? None of your business, Mary. Tell that to Mother. Is that a dinner? I came as soon as I could. Whose carriage is that? That is your great-grandfather's cousin's. Charles Carroll? Yes, and you can have dinner with them in a few minutes. So rinse yourself off, present yourself as a young lady, not a savage. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Anne. I haven't seen you since you were a baby. Please. Hello, sir. Since your great-grandfather's deceased, you can call me Grandpa. I was explaining to your father about what Baltimore can do to keep up with Pennsylvania and New York economically. We have the railroad. Yes, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. This will be Maryland's way to the West. Even at your age, you still go at full speed. Never be afraid to try something new. At my age, indeed. Look at yourself. A bright young man with a law degree. A leader. Have you thought about running for governor? I have a wife, eight children, over a hundred slaves to support. This household needs my law practice. Grandpa, what was it like back in the days of the revolution? Risky. We had much to lose. Fortunately, there was George Washington. Did he really have wooden teeth? Hush, Anne. What was he like? What made him great is, he gave up his power. No other man would have done that. What have your parents taught you? My mother taught me how to sew. Do you like to sew? Not particularly. Can you play an instrument? No. Can you sing? Not on key. <laughs> well, has your father taught you something? History and law. Few people in this country know their history. But I must say, a very unusual education for a young woman. Gentlemen? Will you please excuse us? Thank you, dear. I couldn't waste a mind like hers. What are you doing, son? She runs around in the woods with one of your slaves. What company does she keep? The Johnston Plantation is the only one close to here. Those Johnston boys are young jack napes. Besides, our educated slaves are better company. She can't cook, she can't sew. She's studying law. The last time I inquired, there were no women lawyers. 
What harm does it do to develop her mind? Intelligence is fine, but how's she going to fit into our world? You didn't eat much tonight. I wasn't very hungry. This one looks important. Ah, they want me to run for governor. Grandpa was ready. Grandpa doesn't have to run a household. Mother can do it. I can help. I'm talking about finances. Have you ever sold a slave? Never. They're part of our family. Father, could we make more money by growing cotton instead of tobacco? Well, maybe, but it'd be the wrong kind of money. How? Well, it's... It's much harder on the labor, and besides, cotton grows better in the South. Who's Patty Cannon? Who mentioned her name? Leah. That's a good place to stay away from. Her men hunt down freed slaves for her to sell to the cotton plantations. That's horrible. Maybe if you become governor, you can do something about her. Maybe I will if I become governor. Thomas Carroll did become governor, but he left office after one year to deal with financial problems and a sick wife. Miss Ann helped him get a job as a marine insurer. I don't know how you find anything on this desk. I have my system. Looks a mess to me. Ah, oh, Lieutenant MacArthur. Sir? There was a person you wanted me to meet who might be helpful. Allow me to present my daughter, Anne. She writes newspaper articles and political pamphlets. How do you do? Forgive me, sir, but the rotten hull of the Albany. Sir, my friends are on that ship. And the Secretary of the Navy, Dobbin, he doesn't care about the ship or the men on it. How can pamphlets help? No politician likes to be embarrassed. Would you have any objection if I were to write an open letter to J.C. Dobbin in the National Intelligence, sir? No objection, ma'am. As a woman concerned about the wives and children of the men on the Albany. I'm just not sure that that will work. Miss Carroll. Good evening. Uh, Senator Davis. Senator Breckenridge. To what do we owe the honor of this visit? You've done some railroad lobbying. Actually, my daughter Anne is the lobbyist. I prefer to speak to the gentleman of the household. I have a project of my own. Do you mind? Here is what I am working on. A railroad from Charleston to Memphis, and then a line south to Vicksburg. Then another line across the Mississippi and west all the way to San Francisco. What do you need from me? Northern money. <laughs> You're talking to the wrong man. My family and I have been living hand to mouth since the Depression at 37. But you have political capital. People visit your home, business leaders, Congressman from the North and the South, you're a moderate. Everyone trusts you. <laughs> I'm trustworthy, but I'm poor. Some introductions, perhaps. When we talk of federal grants or loans for a Southern Railroad, Northern politicians want one of their own, north of the Mason-Dixon line. I wish we could build all the way to the West without help from the North. All they do is impede us. How do they impede you? You have slaves. You should know. Perhaps slavery is an institution that's become tired, like old politicians. I, I apologize. But, but what does slavery have to do with this? Slavery is our economic system. If you are in a minority, such as we plantation owners, you are ignored. We are unable to pass any legislation to help our region. And this has been going on for far too long. Northerners cannot see it. They do not see it. 
the majority has to take care of the minority. Or the minority will take care of itself. We need elected officials who aren't against the South. We need lobbyists like your daughter who understand. I understand your need for the railroad. I will help you with that. It is just a matter of time. I am sorry. Dobbin isn't smart enough to care about public opinion. You did your best. But my friends. Captain Jerry came to dinner a week before he sailed. Can you get me the orders he was given for the past 15 months? I think I can. Why? I'm going to publish them. I already have details on the ship. How many did you know well? Seven. Or eight. Get me as much information as you can about them. Their backgrounds, what they like to do. How many children they had. Let's see whether the public likes the way the Navy runs its ships. What good will it do? It won't bring my friends back. Here we are, gentlemen. Thanks to Mr. Carroll and uh, his daughter. Nice, friendly surroundings, and we're from the same party. What do you think we have in common? Slaves? We both own railroads. Here's mine, the uh, Illinois Central. Now, it's occurred to me that there are certain manufactured goods from the northern states that you gentlemen would like to have coming your way. And we could always use some of your cotton and maybe some of your tobacco, too. My line, Charleston to Memphis, it would not have to go much further than 100 miles to meet yours. And I believe I can talk our shareholders into paying for it. If you can come up with some guaranteed cotton prices for the next few years. You can count on that. Cotton prices for railways. Senators, aren't we oversimplifying things? What else do you want? Your support, when the time comes. <clears throat> I can help your economy. How so? What would be the problem and running a railroad from St. Louis to San Francisco, if the money were available. The North gets connected to the gold in California and the products that come from the Orient. Slave states don't. Oh, assuming there are no slave states in the Northern Territory. The Compromise of 1850 was not an assumption. It is the law. Oh, laws can be changed. We're senators. <clears throat> what if we just pass some new legislation? Let those people decide what they want. Slave or free? Now you think about it. This may be too good to be true. He is going to use northern money to join our railroads. He's opening up northern territories to slavery. We didn't even ask for it. I still like our original plan. Give it a chance. We've got Buchanan lined up for the next election. The Chief Justice is a slave owner. And now, we've got Douglas. I don't know how much he can really do. We can go to Cuba, Central America right now. Let the Yankees bankrupt themselves and go west or even north. Let's think about it. Mr. Douglas certainly enjoys his bourbon. I suppose we should be going. Otherwise, we may end up like Senator Douglas. I agree. Miss Carroll, I hope you will remember us as gentlemen who recognize their limits. Thank you for your hospitality. Gentlemen, thank you for coming.
<laughs> so, how did our northern Democrats get along with our southern Democrats? Would you think of me as strong-minded if I said I'd like to start a new political party? One minute, please. <clears throat> Won't you sit down? General Scott, my assistant, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Dunbar. Sir. <clears throat> I imagine you all didn't come here to listen to war stories. We're looking for a good American who is not a Catholic. Mr. Dunbar. <laughs> well, I used to know one back in my lost youth. Father says you're too modest. You can't be happy with James Buchanan becoming the next president. Yes, well, I think I'm still a Whig. But people say there are no Whigs anymore. We have secessionists who feel so strongly about slavery, they're willing to give up everything and go on their own. Not to mention the politicians. We're busy stuffing the ballot boxes with purchase votes from immigrants who don't even know who they're voting for. Catholic immigrants. Yes. Well, that cost me the last election. We want to preserve the Union. We want to include every region, every citizen. We need a leader that can stand on high ground above factionalism and self-interest and keep this country together. Without stuffing ballot boxes, correct? <laughs> a politician who can stand on high ground? Does this person have to be able to win the election? You always have stood on high ground. Yes, but that is because I am a large person. Will you run? Hmm. No. I'm too old. I'm too slow. And I'm too whiggish. All right, we tried. Let's go. Who else has a chance? <clears throat> well... There's Millard Fillmore. His wife just died. And he has some time on his hands since the last election. He is known to the public. Well, most ex-presidents are. I suppose we can speak with him. Yes. Would you all care for some good tea? The American Party. Good name. It has a better ring to it than Whig. Oh. President again. Incidentally, Miss Carroll, you were splendid in the expose of J.C. Dobbin and the Department of Navy, and you caused Congress to revise the Navy Code. Thank you, Mr. Fillmore. Many people help besides me. No, no, no. Please, call me Millard. Can we count on you to be our candidate? Yes, will you join us? It hasn't been long since my wife died. If it's any consolation, I think she'd be proud. This country is becoming pulverized. If I push to bring the Missouri Compromise back, I'll be accused in the South of being an abolitionist. And if I don't do it, well, I'll be accused in the North of being weak on opposing slavery. We're the only party that stands as an alternative to secession or war. Yes, preserve the Union. Oppose the Catholics from Europe. Is that your position, Mr. Hicks? Yes. Well, does the American party include American Catholics? Yes. It's just the people right off the boats we don't want. My health is not good. Are you willing to help me on the campaign? Yes. I'll give it a try. Uh, Miss Carroll, have you ever been to Niagara Falls? No, sir, I haven't. Well, you'll have to visit me there. Quite beautiful in the fall. We might be a new party, but we do things with style. Thank you, friends. I look forward to becoming governor and representing this great nation. To the future Governor Hicks. What have you heard from our standard bearer? Yes, what have you heard from Millard? Not much. He answers about one letter in ten. He's in Florence taking a cure. Hmm. 
It's more presidential to go on vacation after you've been elected president. At least he could send us some position. That way we can drum up some publicity. Fremont may be a long shot, but he has his face in the news every week. Mr. Fillmore thinks if he starts competing with Fremont and the abolitionists, he may win the North, but without the South, he'll lose the election. Write no evil, speak no evil, do no evil. That's a good idea. I can't understand how his strategy could work. I admit he doesn't inspire passion. I can only write negative pamphlets about Buchanan and Fremont. When does Miller return to America? In a few weeks. We can arrange for a photographer and a news conference. That may be hard to do. He's going directly to Niagara Falls. What for? They keep hiding out. What do you think? I'm not sure. He wants me to join him. Well, hello there. What's your name? I, I got money. Pardon me, sir. I'm waiting for my nephew. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, never mind. Good evening, nephew. What? what who was that? A man with a wrong idea. How are the results? The re oh, uh, not good, not good. Buchanan has it. The bar is full of know-nothings. They should be happy. You should go back and ask them to buy you a drink. They all got paid today. Fine idea, fine idea. I could use a stiff drink. Could you help me out with that? Well, I suppose we have four years of Breckenridge and Buchanan to look forward to. I'll risk being thought unladylike and ask you to buy me a drink as well. Oh, not at all, not at all. It'd be my pleasure. Um, I understand he proposed. You said no. I'm trying to think about something pleasant. On a lighter note, Mr. Hicks is the leading candidate for governor, and it looks like we'll get some congressmen into office. So the American Party lives. That's the spirit. I'll get those drinks. We'll do better in 1860. Is this uh, the uh, American Party headquarters? We'd like to believe so. You are a woman. You are observant. Anne Carroll? I want to be the spokesman for the man whose property is his, his plow and his wheelbarrow, contented and self-respecting. You've memorized lines from my great American battle. Oh, and I... Could continue, ma'am. Believe me, uh, perhaps you would prefer to I if I recited uh, uh, the Star of the West. Who are you? I am your congressman from Texas. Miss Carroll, your pamphlets won me the election. Lemuel Evans. <laughs> At your service, ma'am. Welcome to our caucus. I am Tom Hicks. Edward Bates. The pleasure is all mine. I am truly honored. <laughs> are there any delegates in here? I guess not. Aren't you supposed to be at home with your husband? I will ignore that. We are American Party delegates. What are American Party delegates doing at the Republican National Convention? We want to nominate Judge Bates. Edward Bates. Thurlow Weed. You should include him on your ballots tonight. Why should we do that? Would you rather have us go to the Democratic Convention in Baltimore? Your party will support whoever we nominate? Of course. Enjoy the champagne. Seward's ahead. But not by a majority. Chase is second. How did I do? How close was the balloting? 
Our votes can make a difference if it weren't for Seward. Do people know that Seward is using public money for parochial schools in New York? Can you prove that? We can certainly make use of this. I have something too. He's tied to Tammany Hall. This will kill him. We need to get this out before the next ballot. I'll, I'll see to it. Um, Miss Carroll, will you join me? Not now, Mr. Evans. Well, who do we support? What about Chase? No, he's an extreme abolitionist. Abraham Lincoln. He appears to be a pro-union moderate, similar to us. What is his position on slavery? Well, he is not an abolitionist. But in his last seven debates with uh, Douglas, he did come out against the expansion of slavery. They say he's as tall as a giraffe and his clothes don't fit. If he's a pro-union man, what does it matter what he looks like? I suppose we can't do any better than to support Lincoln. Are we agreed on Lincoln? Yes. Yeah, I suppose. Abraham Lincoln, I believe so. Mr. Evans, Mr. Hicks, will you bring us a Simon Cameron man and a Salmon Chase man? Secretary of Treasury. With all due respect, sir, that would be the last office I would give Simon Cameron. He's not exactly n noted for uh, keeping his hand out of the till. <laughs> Secretary of War. Not much better. That would be fine for Simon Cameron. Done. Uh, Mr. Bates. Attorney General. All right. All right. Then Salmon Chase can be Secretary of the Treasury. He will accept that. What about you, Mr. Smith, for so ably representing the interests of your candidate? Caleb Blood Smith, Secretary of the Interior. I do so enjoy the out of doors. Well, as long as you've come this far, you might as well make Seawood the uh, Secretary of State. Uh, Mr. Hicks, Miss Carroll, do please excuse us. How do you think Mr. Lincoln will like his new cabinet? Everyone who's run against him, they should fit as well as his clothes. Anne Carroll. Mr. Breckenridge. My condolences for coming in third. I never had any real chance of winning. I advised them not to split the party. It was a sure scenario for a Lincoln victory. So are you planning on going your own way with the rest of the South? To secede or not to secede? That is the question. <laughs> Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or take arms against the sea of troubles, I'm choosing outrageous fortune over taking up arms. There's a rumor that when Buchanan leaves office in March, the South is going to try for a coup and bring you in as president. The Maryland plantation owners and the Baltimore merchants are going to leave the Union. You already know the South is going to leave when we change presidents. There is a Baltimore gang planning to kill the president when he comes through there on the train to his inauguration. Take heed. The doors are closing. We must be going. Ha, ha, ha. 
I make a rather large target. <laughs> I'm glad you're on our side. Mr. Seward, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Say, I believe I met a member of your church. How's that, Mr. President? Well, this morning I was on the way to the Capitol, and our carriage got stuck in the mud, and the driver let out a blue streak of curses. I said to him, say, are you an Episcopalian? He replied, what would lead you to believe that I'm an Episcopalian? I said, well, you know, Secretary Seward is a member of the Episcopalian Church, and um, you talk to God just as he does. <laughs> <laughs> well, sir, my faith's in my heart. It's not in my mouth. Mr. Stanton, good morning. Won't you join us? The South just fired on Fort Sumter. Miss Carroll, disunionists want to make Maryland the base of their operation. If they take our state, they'll have the capital surrounded. If they take the capital, France and England will recognize them as independent. Their navy will destroy ours. They're trying to push for a special election, pressuring me to convene. Who has the numbers, unionists or secessionists? If we took a vote today, Maryland would be out of the union. And you'd be out of a job. How long can you put them off? Not long. At your suggestion, I made a public announcement that it is my unalterable determination that Maryland will stay in the union. They're seeking to have their own convention, to vote, to secede. Who needs a governor? It's time for me to meet the president. Mr. Nicolay, would you take this down, please? Dear Mr. Chase, I am told that there is an office in your department called the Superintending Architect of the Treasury Department, which is wanted now by a gentleman by the name of Christopher Adams. Mr. Adams is well qualified, but the great point here is that both Simon Cameron and William Seward join in recommending him. I suppose the like of this has never happened and never will again. What say you? Yours truly, A. Lincoln. Very good, sir. <laughs> Who's next? I'll go send them in. Good afternoon, Mr. Prez, President. <laughs> Lemuel Evans. Good afternoon. How are you? Oh, very well, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I would like to introduce to you Miss Anne Carroll of Maryland. Uh, Miss Carroll is one of your strongest supporters. Huh. I didn't know I had any strong supporters. Oh, come now. Miss <clears throat> Carroll, how may I help you? I came to help you, Mr. President. Would you please excuse us? It wouldn't be good for the country if Maryland were to join the Confederacy, would it? Certainly not. The national capital would be surrounded by the enemy. I just left Governor Hicks. He says that if you send federal troops to arrest a few rebel leaders, Maryland will stay in the Union. Chief Justice Taney says I can't do that. He says that's up to Congress, and they won't act. You know he's a slave owner and a Southern sympathizer. I am aware of his sympathies from the Dred Scott decision, which he wrote. Why aren't you opposing him now? I can't do that. He is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I have enough problems with raising troops and trying to figure out what my cabinet is up to. Sir, you are the President of the United States. This is a national emergency. You can suspend habeas corpus. I'd like that. If you wouldn't mind, I'll write you a legal brief and bring it to you. You should think about getting a better filing system than your hat. I hope the Constitution isn't in there.
Good morning, Mr. President, Mr. Stanton. Mr. Chase. Good Lord, why are you shining your own shoes? Whose shoes would you have me shine? Going on a picnic, Miss Chase. <laughs> More than that, Mr. President, we're off to watch our troops teach those rebels a lesson. Well, I certainly hope they cooperate with the learning process. Our carriage awaits. We'll report back in about eight hours. The Black Hawk War was nothing like this. No war is a picnic. Stop! Don't run, you cowards! What are you, soldiers or women? Stay with me. We'll make a stand over here. Right here. Fix this damn dereliction of duty. We are going to stop this runaway. Yeah, damn it. Gentlemen, I know next to nothing about military operations. But I do know that we just took a big licking. <clears throat> General Scott, you've been at this for 50 years. What went wrong? Hmm. Now, where do I start? There was poor intelligence. There were overconfident military officers. There were not enough serviceable weapons. Not enough serviceable weapons? Mr. Chase, Mr. Cameron, why are there not enough serviceable weapons? I gave him the money he asked for. That's correct, and I spent it. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough because you spent it on straw hats. Which one of your friends got that contract? Are you questioning my patriotism? We're talking about straw hats, not patriotism. Let's not bicker. We're all on the same side. Oh, don't waste your diplomacy on this pompous ass. Listen to him. Maybe one of you could ask him, diplomatically, how much of a kickback he got. You are scurrilous! I did not come here to listen to this. Uh, please excuse me. You may deal with my able assistant, Mr. Stanton. This reminds me of Illinois politics. I'm feeling homesick. It's a good thing he left. I was thinking about challenging him to a duel. Now that would have inspired public confidence in our cabinet. General, what's our next step? <clears throat> the Capitol must be protected. Oh, don't uh, look at me. I'm the undersecretary. Now that's reassuring. We'll raise more troops. We'll bring them here. We'll have to act soon. If Washington falls, the British will see it as an opportunity for a divide and conquer plan. Excuse me, gentlemen. Sir, this was just delivered by Miss Ann Carroll. It's her legal brief of your presidential war powers. Miss Carroll. You sent for me, Mr. President? Assuredly, I did, Miss Carroll. 500 copies of this brief are needed immediately in order to get this information into the hands of our political friends. I suppose I can find a printer. I shall speak to Mr. Hicks about who he wants arrested. Thank you. You have a very impressive legal mind, Miss Carroll. Your book doesn't necessarily match your cover. I beg your pardon, Mr. President. Neither does yours. Yes. The late Senator Douglas accused me of being a two-faced man once. I told him, if I had another face, do you think I'd wear this one? <laughs> Sir, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> I know. I was raised in a world of law and politics, not so usual for a woman. I was raised in a world of poverty, with only about one year of formal schooling. Well, that obviously didn't hold you back. I only wish I could make this war go away. You will. Let's hope you're right. Say, we're having a ball Saturday night. Why don't you join us?
Would you care to dance? Not particularly. Miss Carroll, perhaps you and I should find the time to... I don't think so. There are some women who do find me attractive. Well, maybe you should find one of them. <laughs> Mr. Evans, <laughs> Miss Carroll. Miss Seward, would you care to dance? I'd be delighted. Mm. I'm surprised to see that your friend John Breckenridge is the last Southern senator left. Yes, he and Jefferson Davis are quite friendly. A little too friendly for me. You have concerns? More of a feeling. Do you think he's up to something? I've heard him talk. He and Jefferson Davis in my father's own home. Well, it's of no consequence. I think Mr. Breckenridge is more interested in money than politics. We shall see. Ah, oh, my lovely wife has returned. Good evening. I do know this uh, wonderful place for a picnic. You don't give up. No. Present to you Mary Lincoln, my wife, Anna Carroll. Very nice to meet you, Mrs. President. Now you've seen the long and short of it. <laughs> Miss Carroll, help us get things straightened out in Maryland. How very interesting. Miss Carroll, it's very nice meeting you. Excuse me. I saw you looking at Kate Chase. Mother, she is young enough to be my daughter. She is rather good looking, but not as good looking as you. Who is Ms. Ann Carroll of Maryland? Gentlemen, what we've been doing isn't working. I've decided to give George McClellan a try. That pompous midget, with all due respect, sir, I think you're making a grave error. He has credentials. Credentials. He dresses like a soldier, but that's all you can say about him. We've got other problems. Look at these expenditures. $10,000 for straw hats. $100,000 for two warships the Navy rejects as unsafe, and $30,000 for linen pantaloons. It appears that Simon Cameron has entrepreneurial talent. When I first took this office, I thought to myself, the only thing Simon Cameron wouldn't steal is a red-hot stove. I now retract that thought. He would. Mr. Stanton, you're about to become my new Secretary of War. You've been doing the job anyway. Seward, would you tell Mr. Cameron that he is to be our new minister to Russia? It would be my pleasure. So, gentlemen, do I look like a Comanche? You look like an idiot. Yeah, but it's better than that bald look. Uh, come to the East Room tomorrow afternoon, and I'll introduce you to the leaders of the four different Plains Indian tribes. Four tribes? I suppose that explains the expenditures for China and dinnerware. China and dinnerware? How much was this expenditure? $10,000. What about it, Mr. Smith? This is wartime. Uh, the Treasury, sir, isn't my department. If you didn't authorize it, who did? Actually, sir, it was your wife. Well, I don't 
Don't suppose I can send her to Russia? Senator Breckinridge, my fellow senators, my fellow countrymen, I must speak to you about practicality and virtue. It is expedient to send federal troops to Maryland to arrest those who don't agree with the president. I realize it is not expedient to have to charge those people with crimes. Perhaps that's because they haven't committed any. Does it say in the Constitution anywhere that a state can't decide to leave the Union? No. Isn't it time to stop the bloodshed between brother and brother? Isn't it time for peace? What you mean when you call for peace is that 11 of our states can go their own merry way to spread slavery without us trying to do anything about it? I want the United States of America to be united. You want to preserve the Union by force. I want to preserve my civil liberties. Our President Lincoln takes money from the Treasury anytime he decides he needs it. Is this a democracy or is this a dictatorship? Careful, Senator, those words could be treasonous. What is our country without its Bill of Rights? Beware this country bumpkin. He started this war as an excuse to take away our rights. I say that our concern be not to preserve the Union, but to preserve our Bill of Rights. What you want to preserve, sir, is slavery. Never have trusted Breckenridge. This war didn't just happen, it was planned years ago. Oh, I know you was hoping he wasn't like those other secessionists. He's not, he's more devious. Now I know why he didn't leave. You take on so many worries. Maybe this problem is someone else's. It's no one else's. I don't believe in waiting for someone else to act. I'm going to write a reply he won't ever forget. Mr. Nicolay, please send this message to General McClellan. Do something, anything, and let me know when you're going to do it. <sighs> Gentlemen, I am not a military man. I need your help. Any ideas, Senator Wade? No, I've been a fighter my whole life, but I'm no general. We need a plan. General Scott? <clears throat> we need two things. First, we need a way to split the South, to cut the Confederates off <clears throat> from their supply lines. Well, now, why don't we... It's just a thought, but why don't we just send gunboats down the Mississippi, fully armed, with an army behind them? Uh, the Confederates have fortifications all along the river. I, I'm not sure how far our gunboats would get. Do we know that? What else? Well, second, we need a general who can fight. Not an old man like me who can barely walk. But a man can get at them, stay on them, reduce their troops. As long as they can put an army in the field, they will never quit. Gentlemen, uh, General McClellan says, leave the military decisions to someone who knows what he's doing. Well, you sure fleshed out Breckenridge. He resigned the Senate this morning. His true calling was to always be a Confederate general. I can use 500 copies of this reply to Breckenridge. I suppose that can be arranged. I'm not used to people fighting my battles, mind you. I'm not complaining. No, it was my battle, too. 
I wish more people had your outlook. <sighs> Mr. President, I don't ever want to overstep my bounds, but may I make a suggestion? By all means. Why don't you try talking to General McClellan? General McClellan, good afternoon. Greetings, General. about this. Please, show it me. John Breckenridge. I always knew he was a southern chicken. President Davis, General Lee, General Johnston. General Lee is about to show us his specialty, how a small army can defeat a larger army. Please, General, we must not underestimate our enemy. The North has a vast advantage over us. Our only hope to prevail is by mobility, surprise, and the fighting spirit of our soldiers. And by George McClellan's mistakes. Let us not disparage our adversary. Mr. President, I believe I can at least hold our line east. I will try to get past Washington and push on to Pennsylvania and New York. I could use a British blockade. You will have to proceed with what you have. They are not ready for that yet. Where shall I serve, sir? We can use your fertile brain in the West with Johnston. We have the same problem as General Lee. We're outnumbered, but one of our men can easily handle three of theirs. And we can outsmart them any time. <laughs> More humility, please, General. You are a Southern gentleman. It's difficult to be humble, sir. We have to hold this line. We're going to guard the West with troops along the Mississippi. And we're going to hold these forts at all costs. Kentucky bourbon, gentlemen. To the south. To, to the, the south. south. Gentlemen, just uh, returned from the treasury. And how do you like our new dollar bills? <laughs> Not bad. I always knew Chase was a better looking man than I. You know, we should have a few million of these in circulation by the time of the next election. Yes, I only hope they're worth something at that point. I stopped by for some news. McClellan has stopped Lee at Antietam. Yes, well, that is not surprising. Our 200,000 troops to Lee's 75,000. But at least we have some good news, finally. Yes, Lee is retreating. McClellan stopped. The Virginia Creeper just crept up to a standstill and stopped right when he could have wiped out Lee's goddamn army. And we haven't really won anything, have we, General? No. Lee still has his army. He's still in the field. Now, Mr. President, we do not accomplish anything until the enemy is either killed or surrendered. You startled me, Mr. President. <laughs> you look lovely this afternoon, Miss Carroll. Part of my observation, you look terrible. Well, lack of sleep doesn't do much for my looks. 
Although mine looks one much to begin with anyway. Things aren't going well. How so? We simply have to win some battles before the people turn against us. I, I shouldn't be troubling you with this. Troubling me? No, don't say anything more. I'm going west to St. Louis to visit my aunt and uncle. I promised I'd still visit them, even though they're Confederates. St. Louis. I went there once on a riverboat. Thought it was the biggest place in the world. <laughs> Till I saw New Orleans. I was only 19 then. Was I ever that young? Say, is Evans going with you? Evans? I hope not. You should know. He is military intelligence. He would be the last person I chose. He's beyond suspicion. You could go as his bodyguard. <laughs> this country is in real trouble. There are Confederate troops all along the Potomac, and more forces westward through Bowling Green all the way to the Mississippi River. And they are moving more and more forces along this line. I believe, sir, that is to protect their supply line and their railroad. Uh, Evans, uh, have you ever served in the uh, military service? No, sir. Stanton, neither of you. And you're the war secretary. And what qualifies you to be secretary of state, sort? We are addressing Mr. Evans. Uh, what uh, qualifications uh, do you have for uh, military intelligence? Well, sir, I always thought I was intelligent enough not to join the Army. Ooh, good answer. But to put your mind at rest in these, sir, I was raised in Alabama, and I am f f familiar with the Southerners and their ways of weaponry and fortifications. And uh, yes, uh, Evans, we have generals that we would like you to report on uh, their effectiveness. What you may be able to observe is uh, the respect they get from their men. John Fremont is the commander out there. Fremont? He's a wild man. He is out of control. Yes, well, another is Ulysses Grant. Sir, he is a drunk. <laughs> Well, I'll be sure to buy him a drink and judge that for myself. <laughs> Gentlemen, we haven't much time. Weeks. Chest wound, bullet in his head. Lucky to be alive. Tuberculosis. We have one doctor and no chloroform, and I'm the only nurse. Mrs. Livermore. Oh, please call me Mary. Mary, do you come here often? <laughs> I live here. Does this affect you? Oh, the ones that are dying, they're the hardest. All you can do is talk to them, ease their suffering. What keeps you here? I'm just trying to do the best I can to make my part of this bloody world a little bit better. And this is what I've come up with. How can I help? Will you teach me to dress wounds? I'll show you some things. But you're a writer, a reporter. You can help more by going back to Washington. Let the people there know the truth about what this war is like. Let them see the suffering. We took Belmont. 25 men, took the whole town. This was your diversionary tactics, sir. I don't believe you boys wanted to fight the enemy. I didn't want to disappoint you. General, they're back with reinforcements. Well, we fought our way in here. We'll fire way out. Just a minute. General Grant, I presume? You are correct, sir, but I haven't had the pleasure. I am Lemuel Evans. I am a Texas senator, and this here is my secretary, Miss Carroll. <laughs> Miss Carroll. Sir, I am from the War Department. Uh, permit me to ask you a few questions. All right, go ahead. What did you do before you became a, a Union officer? 
Well, I was a clerk in a general store. And before that? I sold wood door to door. You graduated from West Point. Yes. Uh, sir, what are your thoughts on uh, Sun Tzu's The Art of War? Well, Mr. Evans, I never read it. But here's mine. You find the enemy, you get after him. You give him all you got. And you keep after him. And you don't stop until the fight goes out of him. Is there anything you'd like us to tell Washington? Miss Carroll, tell them to give me a chance. That's all I want from those people. You'll have to excuse me. Mr. Evans, you give me an army. I'll see to it you get your state back. The man is very unprofessional. Did you see the way he dresses? They even say he goes out drinking and carousing with the rebels. If your secretary is allowed to voice her opinion, I think he has what McClellan doesn't. <laughs> yeah, drink problem. Come, we have a ferret again. It's been years. This is my... This is Lemuel Evans. Good morning, sir. It is a pleasure. Everett Carroll. Uh, fiancé? Friend. Fiancé? <laughs> I like that idea. <laughs> Don't take me seriously. Words just jump out of my mouth. You know, Anna, when your aunt contacted me, told me you were coming, I was happier than a hog in clover. <laughs> but I wasn't my worried about you traveling, what with the war going on and all. Sir, might I trouble you to uh, drive me to the hotel? Absolutely no trouble at all. How is your husband, Mr. Evans? He's been very well, thank you. Good, I'm so glad to hear that. He's been very busy. What, what, what is he doing these days? I couldn't believe that they uh, cast that one actor for that role. I was appalled. It was uh, uh, Where did they get them? Oh, I know. They were so extremely offensive. I couldn't believe it. I didn't stay for the second act. How is it? <laughs> Good. Do Yankee women have biscuit parties? This is my first. Do you cook? Not well enough for others to eat. Well, if you can't cook, you should at least be able to sew. Try fixing this shirt. You don't have to use a fancy stitch. I don't sew very well. Whatsoever did Uncle Thomas teach you? Law and politics. And your politics are uh, skewed. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, may I present our cousin from Maryland, Miss Anne Carroll. Cousin Anne, would you sing us a song? Or perhaps play a musical instrument? I'm afraid I'm not very musical. Then tell a joke. How do Yankees entertain themselves? That's easy. They don't. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do have a joke. Do tell. How many women does it take to understand what's happening in this world? One.
can I help you? I'm looking for maps showing the Mississippi River from New Orleans to Cairo. Well, that's a curious request. I've been up and down that river many times. I know it more than most people. So tell me, what do you want to know? How wide is the Mississippi at Vicksburg? Are there swamps and bayous outside of Corinth and Columbus? Are you with the military? Do I look like I was with the military? No. So why do you want the maps? I'm a reporter for the National Intelligence, sir. I'm writing a piece on the war. <laughs> You've come a long way for your story. Perhaps I could suggest a title for you. From the Potomac to the Mississippi, the invincibility of the Confederacy. Actually, the story I'm researching is the Confederacy, its weak link in the West. <laughs> the Confederacy has no weak link in the West. How shall I quote you in my article? How about this? John William Johnston, first cousin and confidant of General Albert Sidney Johnston of the Confederate Army, voices his unshakable opinion as to the futility of the Union war effort. Well, how invincible is the South once the North opens up the Mississippi? <laughs> the resident expert remains dubious. <laughs> The enterprising reporter remains confident. Maps? You went to the library for maps. That's right. What kind? River maps? Which river? Which river? Yes, which? The Missouri, the Tennessee? All of them, I suppose. Please excuse me. What is it? Oh. Lemuel, I found it. Get your clothes on. We're going to the telegraph office. Hurry up. You, you found what? The Tennessee River is navigable all the way to Muscle Shoals. I have a battle plan. The Tennessee what? The battle what? Uh, give me a minute. Excuse me, sir. How can I help you? Where can I find a river pilot? A river pilot? Try the tavern.
Bailey? How do you spell obliged? <clears throat> O-B-L-I-G-E-D. How can you tell the difference between a soldier and a sailor? No one seems to be wearing a complete uniform. My husband says the seagoing ones are dumber looking. Takes one to know one. He's a dumb looking pilot. Perhaps he can help me. Where can I find him? I assure you, my intentions are noble. I need to send cargo south. You're no rebel, are you? Goodness, no. He should come by Pier 1 over there about 6 p.m. You should be able to spot him. Check his ears. My name's Lucinda. You tell him that you know me or else he won't talk to you. And make sure he knows you aren't no rebel. Lucinda sent me. Your river pilot, Charles Scott? What concerns me is the cargo I have to ship down the Mississippi. That would be a bit hard considering the war and how heavily defended it is. My alternative? The Tennessee. How far east can I ship it? Eventually a port at Muscle Shoals. Then you'd have to track across land to Mobile. In shallow draft boats, I imagine? No bigger than a mid-level. You know the river. Tell Lucinda she talks too much. Hey, Anna, darling, I'm gonna go ahead and carry your bag on out to the carriage. You take your time and I'll meet you outside. Susan, this is for you. Rebecca, something to remember me by. Aren't you proud of me? I can actually sew a little. Would you please give this to Librarian Johnston for me? He was most helpful. Take care. I'm done. Me too. Can we go outside and play? Sure, boys. What do you say? May we please go outside and play? That's better manners. Yes, you may. Father, I spoke to Major Forbes yesterday. He says they need volunteers. I can handle a rifle. General McClellan doesn't think he needs any help from the Lincoln family. You're not taking me seriously. Anything cheerful? Jérôme Napoleon and Princess Claude are here from France. Or the intelligentsia say they're here on a state visit. <laughs> I'm sure they're expecting us to invite them for dinner. Oh my goodness, I'll need some new clothes and the entire house will need new drapes. Now mother, we don't need those flub dubs. There is a war going on. We can hardly provide shoes for some of our soldiers. This is no time to be asking royalty to dinner. When this is over, we'll go to Europe. We'll see some of those fancy French palaces. Do you mean that? I do. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. President. Mr. Stanton would like you to meet him in the war room. It's urgent. There you have it, Senator. This plan, if done in secrecy, 
that will split the South and open up the Mississippi. But there's a great difficulty. Not one single military man among us, not one single Navy man came up with this plan. It is the work of a civilian. Well, now, if that's your only concern, Mr. President, why not enlist the man? Certainly, he's earned himself a full commission with this. This is one hell of a plan. I don't care if it's civilian or not. I think it'll work. To hell with military intelligence. However, not only is it the work of a civilian, it is the work of a woman. You're serious. I'll be damned. Mr. President, Miss Leah Carroll is here to see you. Leah Carroll. Send her in, please. Miss Carroll. Miss Ann sent me. She'll be back in a couple of weeks. Oh, ask her to visit me. Please. You have it? The plan? Yes. Grant's the one. You have to use him. Miss Ann says you read the Bible. He's your Gideon. Gideon, Book of Judges. He uh, killed a bunch of Philistines. Our Confederates, Philistines. I reckon it doesn't matter as long as he kills them. Tell Anne I've taken her advice and uh, tell her that to make sure I'm sending General Buell and General Halleck to help out. We need to be sure that we take Fort Henry. She'll be pleased. Thank you, Mr. President. This will make your day from last month's London Times. Jefferson Davis and other leaders of the American South have made an army. They are also making, it appears, a navy. And what is more important than either, they've made a nation. And if you keep reading, you'll see that they've commissioned a couple of warships to send over here. Damn it, sir, we've only got about 90 days before they recognize the Confederate States of America. We have a plan. We do? <laughs> that would be something new. General, the rebels are attacking. Get Cincinnati. Get my horse. When did all this start? It's been half an hour. Where's Buell Halleck? I don't know. No, no. Oh, hell. Where is Wallace? Lieutenant, find Wallace. Tell him to send a battalion of men to our left flank. And take another battalion to our right flank. I'll go up the middle. Tell him to wait for my signal. On my signal, we advance to the fort. Troopers! Move out! Nicolai says there's a problem. Is a woman not permitted to have ideas? Sir? Let's begin with this. I have a document here signed by 23 officers stating that they observed Grant drinking with harlots and rebels, that he got so drunk that he had to crawl up the steps to his room on all fours. 
We finally have some victories. We can't stop using the general just because he has enemies within. Uh, Halleck sent him back to Cairo. I agree with Halleck. How can we trust this man? I can hardly spare a man who fights. But, sir, it's a political problem. When I have a document saying that he's a drunken lout. Well, we can't abandon him either. What's important is what he does in battle. I agree with both of you. Tomorrow I'm appointing Halleck as general-in-chief of the Western forces, and I'm putting Grant in as second-in-command. How will that help? Thank you all for coming. Gentlemen, you know Miss Carroll. Hmm, an Emancipation Proclamation. Are you going to make it public? That's why you are here. I need some ideas. What about you, Chase? You're our leading abolitionist. You know my position. I would have issued it my first day in office. What about right now? People will say we're uh, doing this out of desperation. I say we need one more big victory. Well, the sooner we do it, the better off we will be with Europe. The slaves should be confiscated as just punishment for rebelling. It'll save us paying recompense. I believe that when this war is over, we'll need to show some charity. Let the southern states have the same rights they had before the war, except for no slavery. They should have to start over again as territories and earn their way back into becoming states. Don't you think that would create some bitterness? Who cares if they're bitter? Who will provide for these slaves once freed? We could give them land and let them provide for themselves. I vote we issue it today. Agreed. It's a mistake. Let's see a show of hands. All in favor of waiting for another victory, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All who want to issue it right now, raise your hand and say nay. Nay. The ayes have it. Don't forget my vote. On to other things. I've decided to replace George McClellan with Ambrose Burnside. Also, I'm bringing General Halleck into Washington as my personal military advisor. Does that mean that Grant is now in charge out west? I suppose it does. If they remember us for anything, I hope they remember this. A penny for your thoughts, Miss Carroll. Mr. Evans, I'm thinking about more than pennies. How was Julius Caesar? Oh, it was a splendid performance. That Booth family really are a great family of actors, uh, especially Edwin. <laughs> I uh, look for you there. Oh, the theater is a luxury I can't afford. I told you I was thinking about more than just pennies. And yet you do so much for the government and they do so little for you. Uh, why don't you submit a bill? I suppose it wouldn't hurt to ask for some of my printing costs. Printing costs? Surely your time is valuable too. I don't want to see mercenary. Mercenary? It's not mercenary to ask for what you deserve. Why do you always undervalue yourself? Let me help you out. All right. Just don't make me seem like Simon Cameron. <laughs> I won't. And then you can take me to the theater with the money that they give you. Huh?
I'm so very sorry to hear about your son. Mr. President, um, this letter just arrived. Read it. Dear Mr. President, you have been a kind friend to me in the midst of great cares and difficulties. I wish now only to assure you and your family the deepest sympathy in your affliction. George McClellan. I came as soon as I could. I'm sorry about Willie. If there's anything I can do. Is there something else? $50,000. Do you know how many blankets this could buy? Do you realize how little money there is in the treasury right now? I think there's been a huge misunderstanding. You are the last person of whom I would have expected this. The proposition is outrageous. I never meant to. I never should have asked for anything at all. Care for some coffee? Thank you, Leah. Is something upsetting you? They're still not using Grant. Halleck sent General Pope to take a fort that doesn't need to be taken. They can go around it and the Confederates will evacuate. Why don't they understand these things? They don't have your brain. There's an easy way to go about it if they act now. They stop, they change plans, they get jealous of one another. It's so frustrating. Is something else bothering you? No one seems to care. Would you like some water? Thank you. Is there anything wrong, sir? General Burnside says he's not ready for major command. But he can be worse than what we already have. Well, would you like me to get Secretary Stanton in the War Committee? Not now. Well, can I... Bring you anything else, sir? Mr. Nicolay, this is a lonely job. Your friendship is enough. Thank you, sir. I think I'll take a little walk. Don't schedule anything for a few hours. Yes, sir.
Someone is here to see you. I'm not expecting any visitors. Mr. Lincoln, Mr. President. Um, I'm not sure what purple means. I borrowed these from the park. I thought they were pretty, but to me it means I'm sorry. They're beautiful. I only meant to ask for my printing costs. Mr. President, would you like some tea? Yes, please. It was selfish of me. Please, have a seat. Thank you. I should have given you a chance to explain yourself. I know how it's been with the war profiteers. I didn't want you to think of me as one of them. <sighs> you certainly deserve some recompense. You've done as much as anyone to turn this war around. It was the wrong time to submit a bill, especially an outrageous one. I'm used to being outraged. I've made contact with General Grant. He has Pollant Scott with him, and they're going to contact us every other night. Thanks, Stanton. Um, Miss Carroll, please proceed with your plan. Mm. Vicksburg is the last significant Confederate stronghold in the West. It can't be taken from the river. We should send a column from Memphis and Corinth down the Mississippi Central Railroad to Jackson. We then go west from Jackson to Vicksburg. Once we are at Vicksburg, we go south and east to Mobile and Atlanta. That's our best chance. I like that. Stanton, please convey this to General Grant. Yes, sir. Sir, why are you deferring to this civilian? General Halleck, I think I'm beginning to understand some of this war business. She has an advantage because she's not an expert. But General Grant, he's a political liability. He's the only Union officer who can carry out this plan. With all due respect, Grant will be like the blind leading the blind. Good evening, Mr. President. Where's Mr. Stanton? I gave him the night off. Something's wrong. This is worse than speaking to Congress. I can't see you anymore, here or anywhere else. Did I do something to offend you? Oh, not at all. In fact, everything you've done has pleased me, everything, especially your friendship. I have a jealous wife. I wondered about that. How you could be with someone so different. There are things she doesn't understand. Sometimes I get furious with her too. But then, look who she got married to. You're perfect. You're perfect for this country. She's lucky to have you. Someone is going to be lucky to have you, too. I'm not looking. You turned out well for a compromised candidate. Is that what you wanted, Mr. President? <sighs> Wrong author. It'll have to do. Miss Carroll, sir. Uh, excuse me, Miss Carroll. I... I prefer substance over style. <laughs> well, thank you. I... 
can't stand formality. <laughs> uh, Scott said you were coming west to help with the nurses. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, no. It is I who should be thanking you. Scott says I owe you my command. Mr. Scott exaggerates. Excuse me a moment. Can you come with me? There's something I have to show you. We met Scott in the gunboats near Bruinsburg. We marched 200 miles in 18 days, defeated five Confederate armies, took Jackson, and came here, only to fail on assault a few days ago, and another one yesterday. That would have worked months ago. Some some buck in Washington trying to hold me back. Probably old brains. They use the delay to refortify. Well, your plans have been good up till now. There's no point in losing more good men in the assault. Well, we've got them completely surrounded, and they're running low on provisions. So if we can't beat them on a full head-on assault, we can at least out-camp them. General Grant, General Meade has just won at Gettysburg, and now you've taken Vicksburg. Do you think the war is won? Well, we've got a long way to go. So what's next, General? Well, son, I'm a soldier. I go where I'm ordered to. But I hope they order me to go east and drive them Confederates right into the sea. What's next for you, Anne? Go back to Washington. Keep the politicians from creating havoc. And have you spoken to President Lincoln? No, I haven't spoken to Lincoln, but uh, we got a meeting arranged a few days from now. 21 months later, Miss Anne was finally called to Washington. You sent for me? Uh, yes, yes. It's, uh, Lee has surrendered and the rebellion is over. And it is now time to nominate for historical honors. We've uh, consulted with the president on this matter and sent for Pollant Scott. We intend to give you full public honors for your achievements. That you, you found yourself, got no pay, and worked to make other people famous. It is time the people of this country know of you. It's only been five days since Lee surrendered, but in the post-war chaos will come fortune hunters glory seekers who will lie through their teeth to get whatever honors they can to get in the history books. It's time you step up and stake your claim. Am I in the right room? Why do you say that? Your boots weren't shined when you went to meet General Lee. What's the occasion? Well... President Lincoln has invited us to the theater tonight. How would you like to see our American cousin? It ought to beat the entertainment in Cairo. Is Mrs. Lincoln going to be there? Well, they're usually together. We're not going. Why not? A few weeks ago, President Lincoln came into your tent looking for you. I was there by myself. He introduced himself and left. The next day, Mrs. Lincoln came storming into your tent scolding me for having the nerve to be with her husband unescorted. I won't go anywhere to be with that woman. Good. I didn't want to shine these boots anyway. Come here and let me help you out of that corset.
we're trying to determine here today is whether or not Ann Carroll came up with a battle plan for the North and whether we should allow the claim to make her a major general in the United States Army. I'm here as an advocate. During the war, a woman came up with the plan that split the South, ended the war. Why the hell don't you give her credit for it? I drew up a map, which is now missing, along with a battle plan and sent it to the war office. Ladies and gentlemen, we make no findings adverse to the claims of Miss Carroll. However, we're tabling the motions at this time. Damn it! These claims should have been granted years ago! This is an outrage! Wars, when they're over, people remember the generals and the battles. Sometimes they forget about the women 